It is called, the, today's sermon, we're going to talk about how you know you are saved. I know that I was saved many, many, many years ago. And do you remember that pastor that was here a few weeks ago, maybe two, three weeks ago, that preached Alberto Motesi? Do you remember him? I was saved under his ministry. In a, in a summer night in Tijuana in 1985, I came to give myself, my life to the Lord under his ministry. So for me, it was a great honor to be able to minister, you know, and translate for this man of God. He is, I don't know if you know him, but he is he's pretty big in the, in the Spanish church. He's very well known. But we started a new series, talk, and, and it's about the new life. The new life is the series. And when there's a new life, there are benefits. When you buy a new car, I, I think the, the biggest, the nicest thing when you get a new car is the new car smell that you get. Oh, it just stinks beautifully, right? It, oh, this smells like a new car. And I think they even make a little spray that is called new car scent, right? Because when there's something new, there's something... There's something exhilarating about that new thing that you get. Like the most beautiful thing that happened is the day after Christmas when my children got a new present. And if it was that exactly the, which they asked for, I mean, just the, the joy. The, <gasps> Papa, this was so amazing, right? I loved it. It only lasted for a week because after a week they lost that toy. It, but when there's something new, there's a new acceleration, there's an excitement. When you have a new life in Christ, something has to happen in you that brings joy and excitement. Your Christian life was not meant to be dull, was not meant to be unexciting, it was not meant to be boring. So disclaimer, if you are a boring Christian, there's something wrong with you. Don't look at anybody. Because right now, some of you may be saying, well, look, I told you, you're different. You're not normal. If your Christian walk is boring, dull, unattractive, there's something wrong with you. Respectfully. <laughs> because when you have a new life, something's got to happen that is contagious. That, that, that people, that, that there's a fragrance about you that is different. This morning, we're going to talk about a new confidence. Ma where's Matthew? Matthew, you had a birthday, didn't you? Thank you. Give it up for Matthew. You had a birthday. <laughs> when you come to know Christ, something happens in you that is transforming. This morning, we're going to now... If you are a church member, if you are a member of the body of Christ, and if you were saved, let me ask you, how, if I could ask you, can you pinpoint, how do you know that you're saved? Very important. Because all of us here are on a, on a journey. All of us who walked in through those doors, we are on a journey that is going to be eternal. Whether it's going to be in the presence of God or absent from the presence of God. And, and that word, that other word is hard. But it is called the lake of fire. And, and I, don't, I, I need to be truthful, right? And I need to speak the truth in love. But if you don't embrace what God has provided for, you will spend the rest of your life, including eternity, separated from God in the lake of fire. What was that pastor that was so nice and cool just a minute ago? I need to speak the truth. My life is to put a ticket in your hand and tell you you are going to heaven. But you, for that, you need to know, how do I know that I am saved? The apostle John, who sat at the feet of Jesus, who put his head on his lap or on his shoulder, and he leaned against the person of Jesus, writes so perfectly in his first letter in John, and I'm going to ask you to put it on your screen or read your outline. It is right there. We're going to read First John chapter 5, verses 10 through 13. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts his testimony. Whoever does not believe, God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about 
his son. And this is a testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Look at me for one second. Everything in the entire universe revolves around the Son of God, and His name is Jesus Christ. Let's keep reading on. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Pastor, I disagree with you. No, you're not disagreeing with me. You're disagreeing with the Word of God. Pastor, I, I, what about the other, I, it's, I didn't write that. It was God, through John, inspiring him to write this sentence, which is definitive and conclusive. Thank you, Chris. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. There is this confidence that we have, this bravado. You like that word? It's my Sunday word. <laughs> you like this bravado, this confidence that we have when we know that we have the life of Christ shining and empowering us every day of our lives. Puedes levantar la cabeza. You can lift up your head and say, God, thank you that you've given me life through your son, Jesus Christ. That is the most powerful thing that can happen. Now, if you notice in the passage that we just read, there are three verses and three times that the word testimony is used. This message, it is intense for you to understand what salvation is and how to know without the shadow of a doubt that you are saved. When you walk out through those doors this morning, I want you to be certain if you are saved, that you are been saved because you have the Son of God. Now, the word testimony, it is important because it, is, it bears witness. That word in, in the original language, it is the same word martureos, which is where we get the word martyrs. To be witnesses, to have a testimony, it implies that you give everything that you have. The testimony... John 3, 16, and it's not in your outlines. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to weave a, a, a plot that God intended from the creation of the universe. But when God gave, he sacrificed his son. And that is why, he, it, is, it, is why it is his testimony. Because he, he was martyred. He gave everything that he had. Every drop of his blood was shed on our behalf. So we can have life through Jesus. That's why Jesus was so, was so powerful when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the? Can you say it with more conviction? I am the way, the truth, and the? Thank you. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. That's how definitive it is. In the, in the letter of John, he uses several key words that outline what he's trying to tell the church. He uses the word fellowship. Read this. Fellowship he uses four times. The word light, this is in the first letter of John. It is used six times. Little children, 11 times. The word father, 13 times. The word life is mentioned 15 times. The, the word love is mentioned 33 times. But the word no... It is used 38 times. What is John trying to tell us in this letter? He needs us to know beyond, to have, to leave no room for doubt in our lives. Because when you doubt, when you don't know, you sell yourself short on what God has provided for you. And so many of us do not know what God has provided and that's why we walk with no confidence. The sermon this morning is called A New Confidence. I want to restore that confidence of walking with the Lord because you know what God has provided for us. This morning, this knowledge of God, listen, it's not an intellectual knowledge. 
is not an emotional knowledge. This is a personal experience with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. There's three ways that people try to know God. Because I know there's many scholars out there, maybe at San Diego State or UCSD or whatever university you're going to go to. There's many people that claim to know God. There's three ways that people try to do that. Number one is intellectually. A lot of people think that God is just knowledge, philosophical knowledge, intellectually. A lot of people try to know him emotionally. Some people try to, so for some people, it's all about that experience that, you know, becoming one with nature and, and being in the forest and being at the sea and, and just feeling God, you know, this. Another way people try to know God is by their works. Most of us, a lot of us came from a religious system that based our knowledge of God based on what we did. And this has been carried on through generations. We're not the first generation of people that are trying to attain something with God or trying to know God based on our intellect, our emotions, or our works. But I am tell I'm here to tell you that neither one of those three really works. Because your works cannot save you. There's nothing good you can do to earn yourself a place at the presence of God. Thank you, Chris. You have your amens ready this morning. I love that. There, there is nothing, my friends. And I respect your religion. I respect your background. But there is nothing you can do to earn yourself a place at the table with Jesus. He paid the price. It is only through him. So, so what I want to do this morning, I want to quickly dissect. If we can understand three things that God has provided. Because you may ask me, Pastor, what, what has God given us? I'm a believer, but you're talking about having this confidence, having about this boldness, being excited about it. Oh, thank you for asking me because I have a piece of scripture that is like a prescription. That is like NyQuil when you have a cold. How many of you have had a cold that is just nasty? You want to go to sleep and then you take that NyQuil and ba -ba bam, oh yes. The next thing you see is, you know, the next morning at 10 a.m., oh, you're barely waking up. That's what I do sometimes. Anyway, let me tell you what God has provided. It is found in 2 Peter 1, verses 1 through 15. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, To those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of our Jesus, our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in the increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That tells me, let me make a pause, that you can know the Lord Jesus Christ and be unproductive and ineffective. That is dangerous. Let us keep reading. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, 
Make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made it clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. This is the Apostle Peter writing in the last days to a church that he wanted to encourage about their new confidence in Jesus Christ. I want to share three things with you this morning Three things that I believe put a wedge between what God wants us to do and live and then the way we do sometimes, the way we behave, the way we live. And these are the consequences of doubt, the cause of doubt, and the cure for doubt. I gave you all three so you kind of know where we're going. Let us talk about the consequences of doubt. The consequences of doubt. What happens when you doubt salvation? Look at 1 John 5.13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. That is us. Do you believe in the Son of God? Do you believe in the Son of God? John is saying, I write to you, CFC, who believe in the name of God, of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. John is writing to a church because he needs them to know that they have eternal life. And then look at the next verse that we have in your outline. 1 John 1, 4. It says, we write this to make our joy complete. I don't know if you've, anybody has played sports in here at any point in your life. Soccer maybe, right? Or baseball. Do you know oh, Hockey. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> surprise me here, hockey. You bet, wow, that's it. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> confidence, confidence makes you successful. When you, when you doubt about taking that penalty kick, you're not going to make it. Am, am I correct? How about that free shot? at the line and you have everybody scream when you doubt you in practice you've made 15 free throws in a row the moment you're in front of the crowd and you doubt you miss doubt makes you miss doubt robs you of the confidence you need to make it happen don't look at me like you've never doubted how about that interview? Okay, uh, let's get away from sports because you say, Pastor, I haven't done sports in 50 years. Okay. How about that job interview? When you walk in with confidence and you nail that, that interview. But when you doubt and you're like, oh, I don't know what to say. John is telling us there's consequences when you have doubt. When you're unsure of, of, of where to go, how to walk, how to, how to behave. There's consequences. Church, there's consequences when we allow doubt to come in. But John tells you, I need you to know so your joy is complete. Why is joy so important? The Bible says that Jesus Christ was able to endure the cross because of the joy set before him. He, joy, joy is the fuel that you need to live a successful and victorious Christian life. Joy a lot, and joy is not happiness. Listen up, joy is not circumstantial. Because a lot of us think, well, I don't have any joy. No, you don't, you're not happy, which is different. Because happiness is based on your circumstances. I have $150 in my wallet. I'm happy. Can that bring me joy? Not necessarily. Because I know that people that have $1.5 million dollars and they're not happy they don't have joy joy you you can have joy 
even if you're bedridden. Joy is important. It is a fuel that allows us to live in the purpose and calling that God has placed on our lives. See, number one in your outline, there's consequences. The first one, if you doubt your salvation, there is no joy in your life. We need to have joy. And, and there will be a day when I'm going to walk in here and you're going to say, Pastor Barragan, there's something going on. Because I wear it on my face. I, I am. I, you, I'm usually smiling. And, and if I'm not smiling, you know there's something happening. But that doesn't take my joy away. Because my joy is not based on what I'm feeling. It's not based on whether Mayela made breakfast for me this morning. <laughs> or the, whether we hit up Danny's or the burritos right there at the cafeteria. By the way, let me, let me do a little commercial. We, did you know that we have a cafeteria that has like Mexican, like Mexican burritos? You're missing out, sister. Chicharron and what today they have the cebrada. And, and if you don't know what that means, you know what chicharron means, right? And the cebrada and coffee and goodies. So you can come with energy to service, okay? You know, because I know that donuts and pastries and coffee are great, but sometimes you need a little more. My joy is not dependent upon whether I had the delicious burritos. Because my joy is anchored in something that is greater. Your salvation does not depend on whether, on the circumstances. Your salvation, it needs to have joy to fuel it. When we have doubt, there is no joy in your life. The second thing that, the second, uh, thing that happens when, there, when you doubt your salvation is that it hinders your Christian service. When there's doubt, D.L. Moody said this in his senior outlines, I don't know any Christian who is effective and doubts his salvation. If you doubt your salvation, you're not going to want to serve God. You're going to question it. You're going to fight it. The Apostle Peter, in, we just read a minute ago, it says that we cannot be ineffective and unproductive. Can I ask you one thing? How, do you, how can you tell what a, what a tree looks like? I mean, other if, if you're a botanist or if you have a degree in botany, well, then you don't have to look at the fruit. You, could, you can tell by looking at the tree, right, or experience. Other than that, how can you tell what a fruit, what a tree is by its fruit? If you can look at a tree and it has oranges, that is an orange tree. How can you tell... If you're a Christian, buy your fruit. Hold on. This side. Buy your fruit. I don't have to look at the way you dress. Well, maybe a little bit. <laughs> I have to look at your fruit. Your fruit tells me who you are. When you die your salvation, you become unproductive. You don't want to serve God. I want all of us, including all those young people that are sitting over there, I want you to get up from your fannies and get up and start doing something. Can I get at least one amen from that crowd back there? <laughs> you were not meant to come to church and be bench warmers. I, I have a side of me that is unfiltered. You can ask some of these guys over here. You were not meant to come every Sunday and just eat and leave and don't pay. And I'm telling them, but I'm also telling you. You were meant to be fed and nurtured and receive the word of God, but there's got to be fruit. You got to get active. You got to roll up your sleeve and say, God, what can I do for your kingdom? This new life entails Something to do. Amen? Amen? Amen. We need to be a church where we don't have a bunch of spectators. We need to be participants in what God wants us to do. Some pe Let me tell you, there's a lot of people that don't believe in this new generation. Uh, I'm, looking at my, I'm looking at the mirror. We, I asked my wife, Mika, what is going to happen with the church, with all these kids? What's going on? But in the bottom of my heart, 
I know that God is working something in you. I know that every time that I speak, I'm planting a seed. And I may not see the fruit now, but it's coming. And I'm going to keep doing it. But young people and older people alike, we need to be confident. And do not allow doubt to hinder us from serving God. And the third consequence of doubt is that you constantly fall into sin. When you're not sure who you are, when you're not sure of the treasure that is in you, you will constantly fall into sin. I wrote this, doubt is the fertilizer that allows temptation to flourish. When there's doubt, there's an inherent contradiction to, with the realm of faith. Why? And I was feeling pretty author. I was like author. I'm like, this should be a chapter or an introduction of a chapter in my book. It says, why? Because doubt is the opposite of faith. And faith is an absolute must if you want to please God. In fact, you cannot come close to God if you don't have faith. And the only one that can keep you from sinning is not yourself, but God working inside of you through the transforming power of His Holy Spirit. The consequence of doubt, the third consequence, is that we will constantly be falling into sin. Now, let me give you, we're talking about the consequences of doubt. We're going to talk about the, what's a cause of doubt. Why do we doubt? What causes us to not be sure of our salvation? Numero uno, so a lot of us do not know the exact time when we were saved. I told you, I, I don't remember the exact date. I know it was in the summer of 1985. But a lot of people say, well, I don't know exactly when I was saved. It's okay, you don't have to know. If you do, it's great. I know exactly the date I was baptized. So September 17th, 1985. I, I remember clearly. Right? But the day when I said, when I committed my life, you know, a lot of people can get doubtful about their salvation when they don't know the exact date. Don't let this happen to you. If you knew you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have to know the exact date and time. The second cause is that because they did not have the same experience that others had. Not everyone is the same. Some people cry and weep and they're just oh, I'm broken. You know, I gave. Not everyone's the same. Can I give you an example? Think about Paul and Matthew. They went to In and Out after the service. Oh. Okay, Chick-fil-A, because I know the kids love Chick-fil-A around here. Right? So they're sitting around, they're having their fries, they're having their burgers, they're having a good meal. And all of a sudden, they start talking about how they were saved. Paul says, oh, man, I'm telling you, I was on my way to Damascus. I had a bunch of people with me. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the road, there was a shining light. It was glaring. I fell to the ground. And out of the skies, a voice spoke to me. Oh, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then I gave myself to the Lord. Wow. It's a big story. I mean, that's like Hollywood-like. And then Matthew's, Matthew, you know who Matthew is? His, is that my time to finish the sermon? I thought I heard an alarm. Okay. Matthew comes around. And what does Matthew say? Well... The Lord, I was sitting at work doing my own thing, and all of a sudden, the Lord Jesus says, Follow me. I got up and I followed him. You say, What? Boring, right? <laughs> See, everybody's experience is different. It doesn't, some of you will have an absolute incredible experience, some of you will be a quiet moment in your dorm. In your bedroom, you and Jesus. The way it happens, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you experience that point of salvation. The third cause of doubt is that people have failed God and they give up. Can I ask by a show of hands, do I have any Christians here that have failed God and are still here this morning? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Can we see more hands? I'm going to raise both hands right here. The Christian walk, JC, 
it is, it means a lot of falling in the process. Can you, am I talking to me, talk to that little kid right there? I know him for a few years. I remember mom teaching you how to walk. Can you imagine that mom, mom giving up on you learning how to walk because you fell once? You, you'd be like this coming into this morning. <laughs> but, we, but, we, but we didn't give up. We said, you fell, you scraped, you cried. We picked you up and we said, let's keep going. The Christian walk is the same exact thing. When you fall, you don't stay down. You get up. Don't let that fall make you doubt your salvation. Look, we already said this conclusion last week. We will sin. George, we said, well, read my lips, right? That was, that we're dating ourselves by saying that. But when you sin, there's a provision already for you. When we, when we fall, we, we cannot doubt our salvation. For, Pastor, what do you mean that if we sin, there's a provision? 1 John 2, 1. My dear children, I write this to you so that it, you will not sin. My desire as a pastor, our father's desire as our father, is that we don't sin. But, can you say out loud, but? But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. What that means is not that God ignores your sin or that your sin is tolerated. Because sin is not tolerated by God at no moment. So how does that work? What, how that works is that when you sin, you say, Father, I embrace what Jesus did on my behalf. And Jesus comes, bendalo, please. And I have sinned. And what happens is that Jesus says, I am an advocate. And you stand in front of me, facing that way. And now what happens is the Father is not seeing me, but he is seeing his son. And I say, Jesus, I, Father, I embrace what your son did for me. And I'm not the righteous one. He is the righteous one. And that's how I can be set free from the consequences of sin. Not because of who I am or what I've done. Because of what it was done on my behalf. Amen. Thank you, Lalo. Amen. Can you give a hand to the Lord this morning? So let me wrap up this morning. Because if you're doubting, there's a cure. If you have doubted your salvation, there is a cure. What is a cure? Think about your house. Think about your car. Think about your marriage. We're going to talk about the cure for doubt. I, I am married, not because I say that I'm married. There's a certificate that says that I married this beautiful lady up here in the front row 30 years ago. Wow. Yes, 30 years. Can you believe that? She's put up with me for 30 years. But when you buy a car, you get a title, and you own the vehicle. When you get a house, there's a deed to the house. There's a document that certifies ownership. Our salvation has a certificate of validity. There's something that ratifies that my salvation, right, it is true, it is legitimate. And when we understand this, we know that there is a testament. Do you get the word testament? It's a new covenant. It's, an agree it's not only an agreement. It's something that is sealed because something was given. There was an exchange. There's something that is transformative about it. Now, when we are saved, in order for us to, to authenticate right, the requirements of our redemption, there's four things that I want you to take this morning. I'm almost done. Give me five more minutes and I'll wrap it up this morning. Number one, the number one thing that cures your doubt that you need to understand about salvation is the word repent. When you repent, it means that you change direction. If you're going to the pit of hell because you've separated from God, there's a moment when you realize, I need to move away from that direction and I need to make a change. Acts 17.30 says, in the past... 
God overlooked such ignorance, but now commands all people everywhere to repent. Why would God, why would God command us to repent? What's, what's the point? And, and we don't have it in your album, but I'm going to read it because you need to know this. Why? I'm going to read it again. I'm going to read it in this translation. God overlooked the people's ignorance about these things in earlier times. But now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. Here you go. Verse 31. This is the reason why. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he proved to everyone who this is. By raising him from the dead. The reason why we need to repent. Because we're all on our way to a judgment. Good or bad. One day, remember when Joshua was before the people. Joshua 24, 15. He says, choose yourselves whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Moses, in Deuteronomy 30, I I encourage you to read that passage. In Deuteronomy 30, Moses told the people, See, I have set before you this day life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life that your descendants may live. The number one, the first component that cures that doubt in us is the fact that we repented. To repent. The second thing that I want us to consider is the word believe. John 3 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. It is not a belief that is up here, it is a belief that is in your heart. You repent. And you believe in what God has provided for us. Have you noticed that I keep repeating what God has provided for us? Because most religions in the world is about what you can do for God. The gospel is for what God has done on our behalf. Is it is the only religion that you cannot do anything to earn it. It's been already done for us. And I need us to live on that grace. We spent weeks talking about grace. It is the grace of God. We believe. Believe in your heart. Remember John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Pastor, is that what I have to do, believe? Yes. 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 Number three, confess. That belief will lead to confession. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. And will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I don't think I need to add anything to that. Number four, receive. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. In Revelation 3.20 says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Would you excuse me? I'm going to finish where I started. I need you to, in this new life, we're going to talk about so many things in in the next 13 weeks. A new hope. We're going to talk about many things about the new life. But the first thing that I want us to understand is that we need to walk in a new confidence. If you are saved, if you've been saved, maybe it was 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you need to fan the, the flames of, of your calling. Paul wrote to Timothy. You need to, get, you need, you need to get fired up about your salvation. You haven't done much in the past few years. Brother, sister, get fired up. Get fired up about what God has done in our lives. Let's pass it on. But if this morning you are sitting in this place and you haven't made that decision to give your life completely, to surrender to Jesus Christ, can I ask you one thing? 
what are you waiting for? And, and we don't have to make eye contact. I, it, what are you waiting for? One day you'll be before the throne of God. And you will have to answer to this that I am saying right now. And I, 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 I pray that on the day you will not be reminded of this moment in a negative way. But you have to make a choice to repent, to believe, to confess, and to receive the Son of God. He has come to meet you in this place. Listen, I want you to live with the confidence and I want you to live that life that God intended for you. And my, I am not promising that the world, is, that everything is going to be all right. I think I already set that precedent. But what I am telling you is that your life will have purpose and meaning. And even in those setbacks in your life, you will realize that God is setting you up for something greater than yourself. I'm going to ask you, church, to please bow your hands. Bow your heads, I'm sorry. Bow your heads. Let us not live one more day of our lives without the assurance that we have everlasting life in Christ Jesus. Being a good person is not enough. Doing good things is not enough. In fact, coming to church every Sunday is not enough. You must, and I'm going to ask you to please close your eyes, church. And if you're a believer, be in a, be in a, attitude of prayer everyone including here up in the stage let us be in this attitude of prayer let us come before the throne of God and ask him that his Holy Spirit will come and touch the hearts of the people in this place but if you're not sure of your salvation you're not sure that you've ever committed your life to Christ you must leave the way you lived up until now and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and confess with your mouth that He's your Lord and Savior. And then you will have this life that I've been talking about for the past 45 minutes. He gave His life so you wouldn't lose yours. And whatever you've lost, you will find yourself in Him. I'm going to ask this one single time. Is there anybody in this room that says, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus this morning. I'm not going to ask you to come up front. All I do want to ask, though, is that if you want to say, I give my life to Jesus this morning, on this, the 13th of August of 2023, all I'm going to ask you is raise your right hand up in the air and then put it down. Is there anybody in the room? Okay. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for this beautiful group of people, of believers. We've studied your word this morning. And we want to live with this boldness and this confidence that will make us share our faith with our friends, with our family. Father, we are not content with what we've accomplished so far. We know there's more. Every empty chair in this auditorium is one soul that could be known. There's one family that could be transformed. Let us be contagious about our faith. Let us live with this confidence day by day, not ever allowing doubt to harbor in our lives. We ask you, Holy Spirit, that you will empower us to be joyful, to be, to be excited about every single opportunity each morning brings. And I bless every family, I bless every person in this place in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next Sunday.